Well, good morning. I'm Danny Levins, uh, senior pastor here at Calvary. And just uh, three things to uh, let you know about uh, before I get started with the sermon. One is, Jared just mentioned it, the Zambia mission team that went over uh, this summer is going to be reporting tonight, so I would underline what Jared said. Come on out, 6 p.m. Uh, also, next week, you may have heard this on the radio, uh, the churches in the area are participating in something called Back to Church Sunday, and we're, we're participating in that. And it's not a rah-rah church is awesome, you know, kind of thing. It's a, uh, it's a invite your neighbors, invite your coworkers to church uh, next week. It's, it's an encouragement for us to do that. Uh, so uh, if you have a neighbor, a coworker you've been thinking about inviting to church, next week would be a, a great time to do that. Of course, you can do that any week. Uh, but this week in particular, a lot of the local churches in the area are focusing on that. And then uh, third, you may notice in your bulletin that we are, as the church elders, proposing some changes to our church constitution, specifically our statement of beliefs. Uh, And you can read about what those changes are in the bulletin. I think it's a yellow sheet in your bulletin there. And if you're a church member, you'll be invited to vote to approve or not to approve these changes in the congregational meeting, which will be two weeks from today after the second service. Uh, There'll be a lunch and a congregational meeting on the 25th. The changes involve statements on uh, the value of human life and then sexuality, gender, and marriage. And these are not new statements. These things are are certainly have been a part of what we believe as a church for a long time. It's just we are actually putting them into the church uh, statement of faith in the Constitution. So if you have questions about that, you can talk to me uh, or to one of the other church elders. And then on a related note, next Sunday evening, we are going to have a, uh, a seminar uh, from 6 to 7.15 p.m. here in the worship center. The uh, church elders are putting it on, and it's on the topic of sexuality. Uh, the elders have prepared a, a document, a couple of documents that we'd like to give to you uh, that will help you as a church family, help us be able to see what, do the, what does the Bible say about sexuality, uh, how do we live as God has called us to live, and how do we interact with the culture around us when there are so many other things that we're hearing uh, in the world around us. So come next Sunday night to that. We are going to have child care available. So uh, if you have young children, uh, please come, bring them. Just let us know ahead of time by contacting the church office. Uh, tell us uh, how many kids you're bringing and what ages they are, and we'll take care of them for that uh, hour or so, or hour and 10 minutes or so that we'll have together. All right, with all that in mind, let's uh, go to the sermon then. Uh, Kyle, when he preached uh, our last message on the Psalms last week, he mentioned that we are living currently in an unstable, uh, uncertain, and corrupt even environment. Uh, There's instability. If you look at the the world uh, at large and and what's going on internationally, there's instability there in terms of how countries are relating to one another. There's uh, uncertainty about the future direction of our country. Uh, We uh, look at our political candidates, and many of them do not exactly inspire confidence in us about where they might lead or take uh, our country, uh, since the candidates themselves have many issues, and they've been accused of corruption and these kinds of things. And then if we look at the moral condition of our culture around us, there's plenty that we can find at fault. Uh, it looks as if uh, our culture has taken the New Testament and turned it upside down and, and is living in many ways the very opposite of how God has called us to live. And the question I think that faces all of us is this, how are we as believers in Jesus called to live in such an environment as this, the one I just described to you. What does it look like to be a believer now? And to answer this question, what we're going to be doing over the next few months is we're going to be looking at a book from one of the Old Testament prophets, the book of Micah. Now, as we go into Micah, what we're going to see is that his situation in the 8th century B.C. in the nation of Judah has many parallels to our own situation. And in the midst of the instability, uncertainty, and corruption of Micah's day, he called God's people to live a life of repentance and love. That's what he called them to do. And as we go through Micah and as we see his message unfold, we're going to see that we are called as followers of Christ to also live a life of repentance and love and love. And today we're going to begin looking at Micah's message and we're going to see how in Micah chapter 1 
we are called in the midst of all the corruption and uncertainty and instability around us, God has called us to a life of repentance and living in holiness to God. We are to shine the light of God's holiness to the world around us, to be the people that God has called us to be. And so here's the outline of the passage we're going to be looking at today. It's Micah chapter 1, and we're going to see in this chapter God announce judgment against sin. And we're going to see how this announcement is actually an opportunity for God's people to repent, to turn back to Him, receive mercy, and to be the people that He's called them to be. And for us, we're going to talk about how that's our response. We're to repent and live holy lives, the lives God has called us to live. And we'll talk at the end practically, and we'll be talking throughout the whole series practically, about what that looks like to live that life and the powerful effect it can have on us and the world around us. So, having given you that introduction, why don't you take your Bible, open it to the book of Micah. If you're not sure where it is, just open your Bible halfway. You'll probably be in Psalms and go to the right past Isaiah, Jeremiah, and and you'll get there toward Micah pretty soon after that. I'll give you a second to turn there, and then I'll begin reading in Micah chapter 1, verse 1. It says there, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheth In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. All right, so the book of Micah opens with an introduction. And the first thing that we see in this introduction is that these words are not the philosophical thoughts of the prophet. These are God's words. They are the word of the Lord. And we learn that Micah is God's spokesman. Through Micah, God is going to speak this word to his people. And Micah is identified with his hometown, uh, which is about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And then what we get at the end of the verse is the historical setting for Micah's sermons. It happened during the reigns of these particular kings of Judah, the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, which uh, we know would put it between the years 740 and 686 B.C., the last half, for the most part, the last half of the 8th century B.C. Now, when I say 8th century B.C., that may mean absolutely nothing to you. Just like when I say and, and begin to talk about the 1980s to my children, it means nothing to them. So we need some bearings here. So let me first of all, give you kind of a big picture of what the chronology of the Old Testament is, just so you kind of have an idea of where this fits in the big picture of things, okay? So here's a sort of a timeline of major Old Testament events for dummies, okay? The the basic main events of the Old Testament. Uh, 1800s BC, that's when we believe that Abraham lived. He's the father of the nation of, of Israel. And then the next major date is around the 1400s BC. And then these da- this, this date is debated, but, but many scholars believe in the 1400s BC, that's when Israel had been enslaved in Egypt and God led them out through Moses and with Moses uh, from Egypt out of slavery. Uh, then a few hundred years later is the reign of David and Solomon, two of Israel's most famous human kings. And then after Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel divided into north and south, the north being Israel, the south being Judah. And then Micah's ministry comes about 250 years after this. Now, a few other major dates that I want you to to know about. One is 722 BC. So during Micah's ministry, Uh, The northern kingdom, Israel, is defeated, wiped out by Assyria. And then in 586 B.C., so about 100 years or so after Micah's ministry, that's when Judah was taken into exile, defeated by Babylon, but then they returned in 537 B.C. So those are the major dates, uh, major events in the Old Testament. And so Micah comes right around the time of the 722 in that that time period, and What I want to do is now tell you a little bit more about the end of the 8th century uh, B.C. And if I could describe it in a word, it would be the word, it's nuts. Okay? It is chaos. There's all kinds of things going on. Israel and Judah, they they had been one nation under, you know, beginning with Abraham, but about a thousand years after Abraham, uh, a thousand years after that, we find the nation divided. 
Okay, you've got the north, you've got the south, and they're, they're not always at war with each other, but they are separated uh, from one another. And the important cities are Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom, and then Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. Now, this time period, the middle of the 8th century B.C., both of these nations are actually experiencing a large amount of political and military success. Each of them have expanded their borders. They're having all kinds of wealth, uh, especially among the rich and the elite. And so if you were to look from the outside in and you, uh, look and, and at the nation, you'd think, oh, that, that nation's having great success. But if you dug a little deeper, you would see that the nation was corrupt. Its leadership, we'll read about it in Micah, the leadership was incredibly corrupt, taking advantage of the poor, uh, and they had turned from God. They were not following Him. They were involved in idolatry. And so there's this corruption that's going on. And what's more, that, politi- that political military success was about to come to a fast end because there was a nation out to the east of Israel and Judah, a nation named Assyria. And that nation was beginning to take over, to gobble up nations in between Israel and Judah and Assyria. In fact, picture speaking of the 80s, picture Pac-Man, okay? Just gobbling up those little dots, you know, in that video game. That's what Assyria was doing, just gobbling up everything in front of them. And so what that meant is that security that Israel and Judah were feeling, that, that, that was beginning to go away. And in fact, they began to fight with each other and with their near neighbors because they saw Assyria coming and they thought, what are we going to do? And, and some of them thought we should fight them. And some of them thought, no, let's make a treaty with them. And they fought over that with each other. And so it's just a period of chaos. It's into this environment that Micah and the other 8th century prophets speak. And the other 8th century prophets, by the way, are in the north... Hosea and and Amos, and then in the south, Micah and Isaiah. Those were the contemporary prophets at that time who were speaking into this environment. So that's the setting. And we'll be talking more about the setting as we go along. It's so important when you're studying the prophets to know the setting and understand what's happening. But that will give us enough to go on for now. So with that background, let's read verses 2 to 4. Hear, you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, And all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. Now, what's happening here is something that will happen in the Bible occasionally, especially in the prophets, is God is calling the nations to a metaphorical courtroom scene. There's about to be a case presented, okay? And God is coming to judge. And as he comes, look at how it's described. He's coming in his holiness and his power. He's walking on the mountains, and they are being, they're melting. And the valleys are splitting open. It's a, it's a fearful, awesome description of God coming in His holiness and power. And now what we're going to see in verses 5 to 16 is the typical pattern that you will see in the prophets in the Old Testament. Whenever God is coming for judgment, He does it by having two main sections in the announcement. He has an accusation and then an announcement. The accusation is, here is what you've done. Here is your sin. And then the announcement is, here's what you get for it. (laughs) Here's the punishment for that sin. Accusation, announcement. And so verse 5 is going to be the accusation. Now, before I read verse 5, I want you to remember the setting here. Uh, Micah is a prophet to the southern kingdom. So he is preaching this message in Jerusalem. All right? And up to this point, I think his audience, the people of Judah, are getting really excited. Because God is coming in His holiness to judge, and He's called all the nations. And remember the environment I just told you about? Assyria is coming, all the nations around them are are, are at war with one another. The people of Judah are probably thinking, all right, God's coming. He's going to take out the Assyrians. He's going to get rid of those other evil, sinful nations all around us. Things are about to go exactly as we hoped for. That's what Judah's thinking. Well, let's take a look at verse 5. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. 
Now, there's a little bit of a surprise. It's not Assyria or Edom or Syria or one of the other nations around Judah. It's actually Israel. It's their northern neighbors that God is going to make an accusation against. Now, the people of Judah are probably still excited about this. They're probably thinking, oh, of course, yes, get them. They're the ones who who separated from us. They're the evil nation. Yes, God, judge them. And the next line is, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Again, the people of Judah are thinking, that's right, Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. Preach it, Micah. That's right. They're the bad guys. But then look at the last two lines. And what is the high place of Judah? Now, high place, that's not a good thing. High places in the Old Testament are places where the nation of Israel would sin against God with idolatry. And he says, and what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Do you see what Micah just did? The call of all nations to a courtroom was not to condemn those evil nations out there. It was God calling together these nations to bring His accusation against His own people, against their rebellion and their sin. You see what Micah has done? He has thrown a boomerang. The people of Judah thought, yes, international courtroom, yay, the nations are going down. But it's that come back to them. God is going to his own people and he's saying, it's you. You are the guilty ones. And he doesn't go into the specific sins here. He's going to do that in chapter 2. We're going to see their corruption, the oppression of the weak. But what we want to see here is more general. God is coming to judge. And he does not come to judge those other nations first. He comes to his own people. And he confronts their sin. He is accusing them, Israel and Judah, of rebellion against him. And so that's the accusation. Here's what you did wrong. Now... In verses 6 to 16, we get the announcement of judgment. Here's what you get. And verses 6 to 7 are specifically directed toward the northern kingdom. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. All her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. Micah announces judgment first on the north for her idolatry and rebellion, and on the northern capital, Samaria. He said the city is going to be so devastated, it's going to be an empty field. You can go plant vineyards there. You know, it's kind of sad when you go into the mall and there's a store that's been closed, right? And it's just kind of boarded up, and you think, oh, there's something missing there. It's kind of empty. Well, this is way worse. This isn't just a store. This is a whole city, okay? And it is the capital of the, of the nation of Israel, and it's been wiped out. That's what Micah says. It's going to be gone. There's going to be nothing but rocks and emptiness there. And he talks about how the idols and everything that proceeded from Israel's cult prostitution, how all of that is going to be turned against them. You see, Israel had, had embraced idolatry, had embraced immoral practices, Those things are all going to be brought to an end. And so God pronounces judgment on Israel first, on the northern kingdom and her capital, Samaria, because of their sin. Well, now Micah is going to turn to his own audience, to the southern kingdom. And before he makes an announcement of judgment, he's going to pause to lament over what's happened. Verse 8, For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals. And mourning like the ostriches, for her wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. This is a powerful, emotional uh, moment here where Micah is just so sad about the condition of God's people that they have become so sinful and what God is going to do here. And, and notice, he, he talks about making, you know, walking around naked and making loud noises. I mean, this, this is strange sounding, isn't it? And it's strange to us, but actually it's very normal in the ancient world. You know, when we mourn, when we grieve, 
In our context, we are usually very quiet. In fact, we retreat into solitude and we avoid social interaction. It's a very quiet, very personal thing. But in the ancient world, when there was grieving, when there was sorrow, it was loud, okay? And in fact, the worse the pain, the louder you got. And this whole business about him walking around naked, that may be a part of his grief, but it also may may be Micah symbolizing what was going to happen to God's people, how they were going to be stripped and defeated, taken into exile by Assyria, and then eventually by Babylon. And so notice what Micah doing, Michael's doing, he's mourning because of the sin of, of God's people, how it's made its way to the south. Judah is not innocent. They're sinning against God as well. And then in 10 to 15, let's read this. We're going to see Micah's announcement of what's going to happen. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all in Beth Laafra. Roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir. In nakedness and shame, the inhabitants of Zanon do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Azel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. For in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Achzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marashah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. It is almost impossible to convey the power of what Micah is communicating here because here's what he's doing. In these verses, in Hebrew, which is the text, the original text here is written in Hebrew, okay, he is naming cities of the hill country of Judah, cities that are surrounding or on the way to Jerusalem. And using word plays and sound plays, Micah is naming these cities and talking about the devastation and destruction that is going to come to them. And since most of most of us don't know Hebrew, most of us don't aren't very familiar with these geographical names, it's hard to to understand. And so what I thought I'd do is to try to recreate this for you as if the prophecy were against Nina. So you can feel the force of it. This is what it might sound like. Milwaukee is going to be brewed and spilled out on the ground. Fond du Lac will be whacked. The people of Oshkosh will shiver and shake. Freedom will be a place of slaves. New Berlin will be whirling with pain. Plover will be pulverized. Appleton will topple down. Menasha will be smashed. And in Nina, you will be kneeling before your conquerors. That's the kind of thing that Micah is doing here. But Micah's is way better than that, okay? It is a devastating pronouncement of judgment that God is going to do against His own people. They've sinned against God, and God is now telling them, here's the announcement. Here's what you get for your rebellion. Now, you may ask, but this sounds harsh. What's the purpose of, of God doing this, of, his, of, of telling His people that, about this coming destru- destruction? Well, the reason that God has given Micah this oracle is because he wants them to repent. He wants them to turn from their sin, receive his mercy, and be the people that he's called them to be. And the language he's using here, I I think I can compare this to the way my parents used to talk to me whenever I would get in trouble. Because what my dad would do, he would typically threaten judgment or punishment against me in one of three ways. If I was acting up or something and he decided that he was going to restrict me from TV or car or phone or whatever it was, okay, this is what he would do. He would sometimes make a conditional announcement of judgment. He would say, Danny, if you don't straighten up, you're going to be restricted, okay? That's clearly conditional. If I change my mind, if I change my ways quickly, I could avoid the punishment. Other times, he would make a, a statement that was, that was final, it was an unconditional. He would say, Danny, all right, that's it. Okay, 
you are getting restricted. And I knew when my dad said it that way, I was toast, okay? I knew that, that I was doomed. And in the Bible, you see this kind of thing, by the way. Similar kind of thing. When, when, it's not super often, but when it happens, it's clear. For example, 1 Samuel 15, when uh, God says to King Saul, I am not a man that I should change my mind. This kingdom is taken from you. Saul's kingship is done at that point. He won't change his mind. God is, is, is unconditional. But then there are other places where it is implicitly conditional. It sounds at first like it's unconditional. And like my dad would say, he would say something like this, Danny, you're restricted. But if I would be, act or be really sorry and maybe cry and maybe change my behavior right away, my dad might relent in that moment. He might not, but he might. It was implicitly conditional. And you see this kind of thing in the Bible. One of the best examples is in the book of Jonah. What does Jonah preach? He goes to the city, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There's nothing conditional about that. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. But what happens? The people of Nineveh repent, repent and God doesn't destroy the city. And I think that's exactly what we have here in Micah chapter 1. This is implicitly conditional. God is telling them this judgment to come so that they will repent. And verse 16, I think, makes this clear because look at what Micah calls the people of Judah to do. He says, make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle for they shall go from you into exile. In the last part of this pronouncement, along with predicting an exile, Micah is calling Judah to mourn, to weep, to repent. He calls them to go bald. That's not, a, that's not for a fashion statement, okay, so they can look cool like Jared, all right? No, it's, so, it's, a, it's an act of, of mourning. It's an act of repentance. He's saying, turn to God. Repent. Go to Him so that you can avoid the coming destruction. And by the way, let me tell you historically how this played out. The northern kingdom, Israel, never repented. And in the year 722, probably not long after Micah delivered this prophecy, Assyria swooped in and crushed Samaria, took the Israelites into exile, repopulated the northern kingdom with foreigners. It was a crushing defeat. And then, in 701 BC, Sennacherib, who was the Assyrian general, in fact, I think I got a picture of him. Yeah, he's the guy on, the, on your left with the cool beard that all you guys are jealous of, uh, right there. Okay, that's, that's Sennacherib. That's from the University of Chicago Oriental Institute. It's a huge relief, way taller than me. Um, that was from a, 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 a one of the Assyria's uh, larger cities uh, there. But Sennacherib, he came with the Assyrian army and he did his Pac-Man impersonation, okay? He went through all these cities, just like Micah named in these verses, and wiped them out. And he got right up to the gates of Jerusalem. And you know what happened? Hezekiah, the king of Judah, hearing Micah's message, repented. He turned to God, relied on God, and God delivered Jerusalem. Sennacherib and his army, uh, Sennacherib fled, his army was wiped out, and they did not conquer the city of Jerusalem. God saved them. So do you see what's happening here in Micah chapter 1? God calls an international court and instead of pronouncing judgment against those other evil nations out there, he accuses and brings judgment against his own people, against Judah for their sin against him. And he does so in an attempt to get them to repent, to turn to him, and to be saved from the predicted disaster. <clears throat> now, I see a lot of parallels between Judah and and Micah, and our time that we are in now. Many of us in our current situation in the United States are disgusted with what's happening in our country. Um, we are appalled at the morals of the culture around us. We're frustrated with politicians. I've heard it said from many of you many times, there are no good choices in the political races. Uh, we look at our world and we think it's horrible, and we get frustrated, and we get fearful, and we despair. But here is what Micah 1 teaches us. We ought to be a lot less worried about the corruption out there than the corruption that is in here. 
God came to his people first. And he called them to be the people that he called them to be. Do you want to know how to respond to corruption in politics, morals in our country? What do we do as Christians with this election, with the horrible direction of our country? What do we do with this corruption? Micah teaches us to look at the corruption, the pride, the ugliness in ourselves and to repent and to turn to God for His mercy and to live as the covenant people that He's called us to be. And so how do we do this? How do we repent and live a life of holiness? Well, if you are not a follower of Christ, then step one is to repent and to believe in Jesus for salvation. Because here is the hard to swallow but honest truth. We like to point out problems in other people, but we are all corrupt. Every one of us, we're all in it for ourselves. And that is exactly what the Bible calls sin. And just as God pronounced judgment on his people, Judah, here in Micah 1, even more so, he has pronounced judgment on all, on all people. All of us deserve uh, and are destined to separation from God forever in hell. But the good news is, the amazing news is, that the God against whom we have rebelled against whom we are, whom we've rejected as our king, that God has loved us. And he has given his own son to take the punishment for sin that you and I deserve. That's what he did on the cross. And then God raised him from the dead. And now, through repenting and believing in him, we can have forgiveness of sin. Uh, God works to root out that corruption in us, and He makes us into the people that He's called us to be, to, to let Him be our King and to live for Him. And so if you've never understood that, if you've never put your faith in Christ, repented and trusted in Him, then, then all you have to do is admit your sin. That's what saving repentance is, it's, and it's saving faith is. It's repenting. It's, it's saying that I am a sinner and that I can't do anything about it. I can't fix myself. And then receiving, accepting God's gift of salvation that he's given for you in Jesus. And you can do that right now, anytime in prayer. Just ask God to save you, and he will. And if you're already a follower of Christ, then your response is to live a life of repentance and holiness towards God. Stop looking and complaining about the corruption out there those other evil people out there and look to the corruption and the evil in your own heart and life. And you may think, well, Danny, listen, okay, let's just talk honestly here. I am not anything like those people out there. I am, yeah, I'm not perfect, okay, but look at that, look at me. I'm a good person, okay? I don't do all those really horrible things. Don't compare me to them. They are way worse, but no, we, we are just as bad. The same corruption that is out there is in our own hearts. It is. And think of these two things. First of all, those people out there are not the standard that God has called us to. God is the standard. Holiness is the standard. Living completely for Him in thought, word, and deed at all times for Christ and never for ourselves. That's what God has called us to. That's the standard. And we don't meet it. And think about this too. Whatever good is in us is from God alone. We have no cause for pride over and against someone else. We have nothing that has not been given to us. So we humbly repent and live in holiness. Now, what does it mean to repent? What is repentance? Well, repentance involves three things. And we're going to be talking about these three things all throughout the Micah series. The first is in order to repent, we have to make an honest confession. We have to acknowledge that we have sinned and not blame it on somebody else or on, you know, environment or conditions or or, or, something. No, I did it. It's me. I rebelled against you, God. We acknowledge and admit 
that we are sinners. We acknowledge our pride, our anxiety, our lust, our sinful anger, our jealousy, our desire to control others, our harsh words. We admit it to God. We don't blame others. We agree with God that we've sinned. That's the first step of repentance. The second is a dependence on grace. There's nothing we can do to make up for our sin. We have to depend completely on what God has done for us in Jesus. Repentance is not me beating myself up, making myself feel really bad. No, that's me trying to atone for my sin. No, repentance, there's sorrow involved in it, that's for sure. But repentance is me empty-handed going to God and saying, I need your mercy and your grace. And receiving that, depending on it, knowing that in Christ, God sees me as innocent of all charges. There is no condemnation against me because the judgment against my sin fell on Christ. It doesn't fall on me. It fell on Him. Therefore, God accepts me and loves me. It's remembering that. That's an essential part of repentance, knowing that God loves me and accepts me in Christ, depending on His grace. And then a third essential step is a commitment to change by Christ's power. A commitment to change. Repentance means that we don't continue in our sin, that we change. And that change has to happen by God's power. We can't do it ourselves. We can't just make a resolution to turn over a new leaf and and that's repentance. No, we need God's miraculous power working in our lives, a dependence on His Spirit. And we need it to, to work in our hearts because our very desires are wrong. We want the wrong things. And so we need God to change what we want and our, what we love and our desires. And that's why it's so important to be in the Scriptures, to be in prayer, to be in worship together as a congregation, to be singing, to be looking at the Scriptures together, to be serving. It gives the op- those things give the Spirit an opportunity to work in our hearts and to change our hearts. And then we make specific changes in our lives. We, we avoid environments where we'll, where we'll sin. We get far away from sin and we run actively toward God and toward holiness. We get accountability. We get people to pray for us, encourage us, people we can talk to our struggles about in our lives. We actively work towards obedience in Christ, and we'll be talking about some specific ways we can do that all through the series. And as we do that, as we live a life of repentance, doing these things over and over again, God will work in you and in me. I know He's done it in my life. He works in us to make us into who He wants us to be. It may be slow. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that it will be slow. But God will work. And for our part, we make every effort to open ourselves up to God's work in us and Christ's power to root out our sin, our sin, our sin, our sin, our sin, our sin. sin.